Thank you for joining us for the inaugural Dive Ventures Ocean Update. But before we get into the program today, I'd like to first talk a bit about what the seminar is all about. What motivates us to become divers, of course, is the opportunity to experience an environment that comprises 70% of our planet. But in your diver training, the emphasis is placed not on the environment, but on the skills necessary to become a safe diver. So divers are often left knowing relatively little about the creatures and the phenomenon that motivated their interest in the first place. This seminar series was designed to help overcome that deficit of knowledge, enabling you to understand more about the marine environment so that your experiences can be more fulfilling, engaging, and enjoyable. So if I can share my screen, let's jump into the first episode. What we're going to do in each of the programs is to follow a standard format. We'll spend a few minutes at the beginning looking at in the news, as I call it. These are news items that I, I will collect over the course of the month that are of relevance to divers or anyone who's interested in the ocean. Uh, the bulk of our time will be spent in a segment called In Depth, and uh, this and next month we'll be looking at coral reefs in depth. Uh, and then finally, before concluding, we'll delve into a segment I'll call the travel log, which will take a selected uh, travel destination from Dive Ventures itinerary and look at it in a little bit more detail in, a, in kind of a different way than just the diving aspects. Also, if you do have questions, you can uh, put them into the chat section and we'll, we'll respond to those uh, at the end. Thank you. Okay, without further ado, let's look at the in the news section. And the end of 2022 was uh, quite auspicious for the protection of, of sharks, one of our favorite critters as divers, obviously. Uh, first, there was some developments with regard to CITES. CITES is an acronym for the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species. And uh, about 180 plus countries are signatories who agree to abide by its uh, its decisions, and the way they uh, the way it's approached is uh, organisms that are at risk of becoming extinct uh, are listed by agreement on one of three appendices. Appendix one is the is the most uh, stringent and protective, and it uh, it precludes trade of any sort of a species because it has because of its endangered status. Uh, now there is trade allowed, but only under under permits and only for scientific research purposes. From the standpoint of sharks, uh, there are only three sharks that are currently listed on appendix one, the, the uh, whale, the basking, and the white shark. Uh, now appendix two is it's different. It's it's these are species that aren't necessarily threatened, but may become so unless there's some control. And in this case, uh, a, an Appendix 2 listing uh, requires that the country exporting that product must uh, do so under permit and have programs in place to assess the vulnerability of that species and to uh, take action if it appears to become uh, at risk of extinction. Now. Prior to this most recent meeting in December, uh, only about 25% of shark species were on Appendix 2, and it made things quite problematic in the, in the legal uh, fin trade. Uh, and importantly, in December, uh, they held what's, what's called a, a Council of Parties, COPA, uh, and uh, listed, importantly, all of the requiem sharks, and the requiem sharks include most of those we'll see on coral reefs, uh, and all species of hammerheads, as well as, as some additional uh, rays, uh, which means that now 90% of all shark species are regulated, uh, shark <laughs> products, fins specifically, would be regulated under these new regulations. So this will not address the issue of illegal fishing, but I think it's an important step. Now, the second, and I think even more uh, important step had to do with our own nation. And uh, there had been a long languishing bill in Congress, I think since, 19, since 2016, 
uh, called the Shark Fin Sales Elimination Act. And it was finally passed uh, when it was attached to something you may have actually heard of, the uh, National Defense Authorization Act, which was signed on, I think, uh, uh, December 23rd. Uh, within that, uh, the Shark Fin Sales Elimination Act, along with several other conservation bills, I might add, uh, were passed, prohibiting the commercial trade of shark fins and other products um, anywhere in the United States. Now, I will say, while this was overwhelmingly supported by the dive community and, and many conservation groups and scientists, uh, there were some that were that did not believe this was really the right thing to do because they fear that uh, this may just drive the trade further underground uh, illegally. However, you all, I think, have to balance that with the fact that this is an important step perception-wise for a country like ours to, to say, no, finally, this is unacceptable. So uh, obviously, I and most of the dive community are, are very supportive of this, but just be aware that th it is somewhat controversial. Turning attention to the uh, coral reefs, uh, some very interesting developments, particularly in light of the wonderful seminar that Dr. Peterson held from SeaCor uh, a few months ago. Uh, and the, uh, the Aussies have actually figured out a way to freeze and store coral larvae. Now that's an important step because currently the asexual re uh, restoration of coral reefs uh, requires working with uh, fresh, uh, newly uh, fertilized eggs, which are only viable for a very short period of time. So I think this will be an important step in in uh, really uh, giving a boost to the asexual reproduction uh, restoration efforts that CCOR and other groups are doing currently. The downside, uh, there the the folks the the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority are uh, looking at uh, a summer with heating uh, surface temperatures being to a point where there could be another bleaching event, which, you know, doesn't bode well, uh, as well, as it said in the press release. Uh, back in our neck of the woods, pillar coral, which is uh, at once, at one time was a very uh, prolific species uh, and essentially is gone in, in Florida. I, I think there are uh, less than a handful of colonies left in the entire reef track. Uh, it has been listed not by CITES, but by a group called the International Union for the Con Conservation of Nature and placed on what they call their red list. Uh, this does not have legal authority, but it certainly is important from a perception and a scientific perspe uh, perspective because it's saying that, hey, boys and girls, let's, let's pay attention to this. This species is very, very much concerned. And then lastly, there was an interesting development uh, on Bonaire. Uh, speaking of uh, the uh, asexual reproduction of coral reefs, one of the things that uh, has long been problematic is how do you restore fish populations? And normally the way that's done, uh, if it's done, is to grow them out uh, on land in uh, aquaculture tanks and then release them once they get to a, a, you know, a specific juvenile state. Uh, however, there is a group from the Netherlands uh, that has established a, a, a larval fish nursery. And so they actually are dealing with the fishes on a uh, as larva and propagating them in that way, and that, that thereupon getting a lot more of them out on the reef. Uh, so the next time you're in Bonaire, if you stop by, uh, I think uh, uh, Sand Dollar Resorts is where the uh, uh, nursery is being set up currently. Anyway, so much for news this month. In depth, we're going to talk about secrets of the coral reef. <clears throat> and I want to emphasize that these are not secrets if you are a coral reef scientist or a manager. These are things that have been known, some, some of which are relatively new, uh, but they are secrets from the standpoint of, of divers and, and folks who are, you know, not don't spend their lives studying coral reefs. So what I want to first talk about before we get into any of the, the technical details is a a problem in, in conservation we call the shifting baseline. And the shifting baseline can be illustrated right here. This image is Harry's Fort Reef, which is uh, off Key, North Key Largo, aerial image, very typical of the 28 other, what we call sanctuary preservation areas in the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. 
And uh, Dr. Phil Dustin, uh, formerly with the College of Charleston, has been researching this reef for decades. And he's taken a series of photographs in the exact same location over the course of uh, 40 years, essentially. And here we see in 1975 what a typical uh, Florida Keys reef, in fact, the typical Caribbean coral reef looked like, dominated overwhelmingly by these branching corals. This is Elkhorn we see in the foreground here. And this was typical. This was uh, this and staghorn coral were the, the dominant reef building corals throughout the, the entire tropical Atlantic. Uh, these are the reefs I remember when I began diving in the Florida Keys in, in 1968. Ten years later, here's the same area. And you'll notice the branching corals are almost completely gone. Uh, it looks like a very, very different place uh, because, in fact, it, it was. In the interim between these two pictures, two things happened. There was a disease outbreak that really devastated the branching corals of the Caribbean, the Elkhorn and Staghorn. And in 1983, 84, over about 11 months, the black spiny sea urchins, which we see periodically on reefs today, which were far, far more prolific, died. 98% of the population was uh, uh, was dead within that 11 month period. And it had a devastating effect because as some of you may know, and we'll talk a bit more about, these were the primary lawnmowers. These were the, 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 the algae eaters that really kept the reef, you know, uh, clear of algae. And that was a, a significant event from which uh, coral reefs have never uh, really recovered. As you might expect 10 years later, and then the most his most recent photograph even was actually uh, almost 20 years ago uh on in 04 and uh, basically uh, the reefs have uh, for a long time reached a state of what we call stasis they basically remained uh, at a coral cover of maybe 5% meaning 5% of the sea bottom was covered with living hard corals now that's the that was a specific example, but it applied uh, certainly Caribbean wide and really throughout the world. Uh, and the bottom the the bottom line is over the past forty years, half at least half of the Earth's coral reefs have died off. Uh, in the Caribbean, uh, the die off was even more extreme. Uh, it went from a average cover of the sea bottom of fifty percent down to ten. And tragically, in Florida, uh, we are down to uh, a few percent of the coral reefs that we had back then. You know, so looking at it from a, a different perspective, this is that same reef aerial shot. And here, outlined in yellow, are the Elkhorn corals, and in green, the Staghorn corals. In 1980, when this image was taken, those areas were outlined accordingly. Keep, uh, watch closely. I'm going to show you 2011. If you missed it, 1980, 2011. So that's that's a, a good depiction of what has happened region wide in the Caribbean with these two corals. It's unsurprising these were the first two corals to be listed on the uh, U.S. endangered species list. Uh, when I talk about coral reefs to divers, particularly those who who come to Florida here. I, I try to make it clear that one of the things they think are corals are not. Uh, these two images were, were shot by a former student on uh, Sand Key off Key West, a very popular snorkeling reef. And each and every day, snorkelers go out and they look at the beautiful coral. Nothing in either of these images is coral. These are organisms, they're called zoanthids. Think of uh, colonial sea anemone, basically. And uh, they do not secrete limestone. And therefore, when they die, they don't contribute to the reef structure. Uh, and importantly, they take up space that corals could actually occupy. These are Palithoa caribiorum, specifically. Uh, and they're uh, an important space competitor, spatial competitor to, to the corals. Uh, they're, they're quite aggressive. In fact, they're, they're poisonous. They're highly toxic. Uh, a different species, by the way, was used by uh, ancient Hawaiians to uh, kind of dip their spears into uh, uh, as, as weapons. And so what does this have to do with, uh, you know, the grand scheme of things? Well, 
Uh, this shifting baseline issue means that what you think is normal depends upon when you were exposed to that particular environment. My baseline, as I said, was 1968. And so when I dive today in the Florida Keys, to me, it's it's quite tragic. Uh, on the other hand, someone who got, made their first dive today in the Florida Keys and they experience clear water and all the pretty fish, they think that's normal. The important thing is we, we need to keep perspective in what we actually have lost. On a global scale, something to keep in mind as well is coral reefs are incredibly precious. They occupy well under 1% of the sea bottom, only 0 .0, 0 0.06, uh, in fact. And yet 25% of all marine species spend all or more or part of their life on these reefs, probably a third of all fishes, in fact. And in the, in, the, in the latest assessment of global coral reefs, we've found that they're about 98,000 square miles. Now, how do you wrap your head around that? If you squeeze together all the coral reefs of the world, it would occupy a space no more than the area of the state of Wyoming. That's just absolutely amazing. And in fact, if, if these resources occurred on land, we would probably have barbed wire fences and armed guards around them. But the problem with this shifting baseline issue and the fact that it takes place in the ocean is that it's out of sight. Most people, most people on Earth will never see a coral reef, remember. And they're underwater. So what's happening to them is certainly out of sight and very much out of mind. We need to keep that perspective in this, this whole conservation issue. So sadly, we've gone from what you see in the top image to the bottom image. And in fact, if we if we don't do something about the amount of CO2 we're, we're pumping into the atmosphere, we're, we're not likely to see coral reefs. You know, certainly your grandchildren won't see these ecosystems. And that's not only tragic, but it's, it's quite uh, imperiling because it really means the ocean is probably circling the, the, uh, the toilet as well. Now, People like to put things in context using dollars and cents. And in fact, the World Resource Institute did just that. And they determined that the ecosystem services, these are, these are measures that ecosystems provide to us that we can quantify you know, in terms of their protection, their uh, uh, resource extraction, things of that nature. And it was estimated that $11 trillion are generated from the, the world's coral reefs. As a point of perspective, there's only two countries in the world with a GDP of $11 trillion, and that's the U.S. and China. Uh, we th This is far more than, than just fisheries. But the sad part and the real crux of the matter is we, we've really forgotten or ignored these ecosystems because we spend far, far too little money in their management. And we really have to reverse that trend. Okay, so much for the soapbox on conservation, which I'll get back into a bit. but. Let's get back to some basics and look at some fundamentals that are often not really ever discussed in, in, in discussions with divers. And the first is what is probably the second most obvious feature of tropical water. The first, of course, is warm, but the second is it's so clear. And it's, 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 it's important to understand why, because it's critical to the health of coral reefs. <clears throat> now, as to why, Tropical water is clear for the same reason the water coming out of your tap is clear. There's not much in it. There's not much particulate, and there's not even much dissolved nutrients. And so as all of this material, whether it's inorganic uh, sediment or whether it's organic material decomposing, uh, is not only decomposing, but it's sinking. And eventually it sinks deeper and deeper. Now, what many people don't realize is that even in the tropics, there is a thermocline. Now, typically, it's quite deep, usually about 200 meters, but it's there. And eventually, uh, in the deeper portions of the reef, it will sink below the thermocline. Now, why is that a problem? When water is different in temperature, it's also different in density. And these two different layers of density make it very difficult for the water to be circulated, in particular, upwelled. Now, what that means is all of this decomposed material, which is actually good nutrient fertilizer, essentially, is trapped 
deep below the thermocline and is very difficult to get back into the water column. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm fighting a cold. So bottom line, because the, ocean, the tropical ocean is constantly warm, there's no way these two water masses mix. And so you have this continual rain of material filtering out of the system. Now, why is that important? Well, if there's no fertilizer and nutrients in the water column, then there's no way for photosynthesis to take place. So you have what essentially are these deserts, nutrient deserts in the tropics. And this goes to an interesting question that Darwin himself uh, posed, and that is how in the world can these systems survive in such low nutrient conditions? And rather than explain to you, I'll show it to you. What you just saw on the image is a tiny little microscopic image of a single tentacle on a single called polyp. <clears throat> if you look closely, you'll see these brown little balls and those are algae and, and the, uh, the polyp has indeed swallowed them, but it's not digesting them. It's transferred them into its tissues and allowed them to continue to do their job as photosynthesizers, creating more food. And so these little, these little food factories continue to do their job giving over most of their byproduct to their coral host. <clears throat> once, they're, once they're inside, they're referred to as zoes and thalli, by the way. We, we call them zoaks in the trade. And you kind of see schematically how it works. Uh, the little zoaks living within the tissues uh, simply take the water they live in and the carbon dioxide. And as all plants or autotrophs, as we call them, uh, they create sugars by combining them uh, with uh, some oxygen. Now, this is gonna provide anywhere from 70 to 90% of the food resource that the coral colony needs. And this really is the whole basis of reef ecology. It's really the most important fact that if, if you remember anything from this discussion, this relationship, this symbiosis with the algae is really the most important aspect of, of in understanding coral reef uh, ecosystems. <clears throat> However, corals are related to jellyfishes and sea anemones in that they all have these little stinging cells we call, actually the cell is called a, a nidocyte. Within the nidocyte, there's this coiled harpoon-like structure called a pneumatocyst, which does the damage because they envenomate and you can kind of see it in action. On the lower left, you'll see a quick video here. That's a, actually a, 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 a coral that's been stimulated uh, to uh, eject its pneumatocyst by uh, changing the, uh, uh, the chemical, chemical structure of the water. Bingo. So it's not just one or a couple, but there are literally hundreds or thousands of these pneumatocysts that can fire off. Single use, they're, they're uh, expelled and regenerated. And you can kind of experience this, although I don't recommend this, on a larger basis. Here I am, I'm touching a large Caribbean sea, a sea anemone. And if you've ever done this, uh, it feels sticky, as you see it's sticking to my finger. Well, it's sticky because I'm being envenomated. Uh, these are tiny little pneumatocysts. They're they're too small to penetrate my skin, uh, so it doesn't feel. I feel nothing but it's what I perceive as stickiness. But it shows you that all of the relatives of corals, the nadarians, uh, have this ability. So the question is, if your food source is inside your cells, feeding you through photosynthesis, why do you need to go out and sting and kill something? And that's because the only thing really that the zoaks are providing are carbo carbohydrates, sugars basically. And just as we would die on a, a diet exclusively made of carbon di of uh, hydro <laughs> carbohydrates, uh, corals would die if they didn't get sources to build proteins. They need protein in order to uh, uh, acquire the amino acids to build their own proteins. And so they, they have to hunt. As one scientist has put it, corals, 
manufacture their own potatoes, but they have to hunt for their meat. And that's really the, the purpose, one of the purposes of the of the stinging cells. Now, in conveying coral reef ecology to, to divers, I like to use an analogy of cities because they, they in, a, in a very real sense, they are cities under the sea. First, let's take a look at the where these neighborhoods exist. The upper image shows you, uh, actually, let's look at the lower image first. The lower image shows you globally the distribution of reefs. And you'll notice first that most occur in the Indo-Pacific. Only about 10% of coral reefs occur in the tropical Atlantic. And you see all the red area. And you'll see how it's concentrated over there off of Northern Australia and Southeast Asia. Also depicted are these circular surface patterns uh, called gyres. And you'll see that the, the blue arrows denote water that's coming from the poles and therefore is cool. And the red arrows denote water that's coming from the tropics and therefore warm. And you see the distribution of the water due to these gyres dictates where corals can form. Take, for example, off the, off the east coast of uh, North America, we see corals well in, outside the tropics. Uh, Florida is not in the tropics. We have coral reefs. And as far north as, uh, as, the, as Bermuda, uh, well outside of the, of the tropics, corals exist because of the, the, warm, the warm water. By contrast, on the west coast of North America, you see that blue water. There are no hard corals uh, along the U.S. Uh, west coast. In fact, you have to get to southern Baja, Mexico to get to uh, water warm enough for that. Now, on the upper, upper uh, left, you see what's known as the coral triangle. And what it's trying to depict there is that the concentration of or the species div uh, diversity is very, very much concentrated in that very uh, concise area. And as you spread out and move away from the coral triangle, the species diversity drops off drastically. Uh, in the Atlantic, for example, we have about 80 species of, of hard corals, uh, where are there 800 species in the uh, Indo-Pacific. Uh, the bullseye, the little X I just put up there, uh, is been uh, established as the most biodiverse region in the, in the ocean, which is an area called Raja Ampat in Indonesia. Uh, becoming a very important uh, dive destination, in fact. So as I said, to understand reefs, let's look at them as neighborhoods. Neighborhoods are not just a random distribution of people and buildings. They, they establish themselves according to uh, geographic or, or physical or cultural reasons, so that there are you know, reasons as to why certain areas develop the way they do. And in, a, in an important sense, so do coral reefs. Here's an example. The, the image on the left is an aerial view of East, uh, East Grand Cayman Island. For those of you who may have, may have dived down there. And it's, it's labeled in the, the classic uh, method of uh, reef, what we call zonation, showing you the back reef, which is the area closest to the shore, the shallowest, of course. The reef crest, which is the area that's so shallow due to coral development that waves actually crash. And then seaward of the reef crest, the fore reef, or what we may know better as the, the wall or the drop off. Now, the reason I depict that is, you, and you see from the little labels there and the, and the schematic, there are different communities. There are different coral species. There are different species of virtually all organisms that occur based on the physical conditions. So, for example, in that back reef, subjected to all of the runoff from the shore, from the sediments, from the uh, pollution, et cetera, from the shallow water, which allows the water to heat and cool faster, there are certain species of corals and that, that really do well there, and there are other species that could not exist there. As you move out onto the reef crest, of course, that high energy means that you have constant water uh, conditions, but very, very you know, forceful movement. So you need a very robust structure to exist. Uh, and then as you descend over the wall, the problem you know, of energy you know, dissipates because as you, as you go deeper, the, the less force there is from surge and waves. But now the problem is light. Remember the Zooks have, they're photosynthetic, they need light. 
And so in order to capture maximum amounts of light, you'll start to see them spread their surface area out to capture more light. So the reasons you're seeing these very different and sometimes very specialized species depends upon the physical conditions in which they occur. And there's a region where basically no species has a particular advantage over the other as much as, you know, in the shallows or deep uh, that scientists sometimes call the Goldilocks zone, where you, you'll gain, get maximum diversity. So what are the factors? We've, we've already alluded to some of these. The neighborhood factors that, you know, create a healthy neighborhood, essentially, are temperature in the tropics. It's pretty constant. Depth, as we saw, varies according to the topography. The water clarity, as we discussed, is important. The salinity we didn't talk about, but basically Carl's like nice, consistent salinity, 34 to 36 parts per, per, per thousand, which is uh, typical in the open ocean. Although there are many species of corals in the uh, uh, Persian Gulf and the uh, uh, Red Sea that can tolerate far more than that. And a few that can actually tolerate less. Wave action is important to rid uh, sediment. Uh, the corals can't brush themselves off, so they have to produce mucus in order to get rid of the sediment, which is energetically quite expensive. Uh, low nutrients, as we talked about. And the, the idea of a solid substrate or a bottom, they, when the larvae settle, uh, they, they need a, a hard surface. If a, a coral larva settled on sediment, on sand or mud, obviously it will not survive because it would simply get uh, uh, brushed away. Here's an example of how the neighborhood factors uh, come into play. Uh, these two images I took on Bonaire many years ago. And they are taken of the same species. Both the species uh, that you see depicted here are mountain star coral, uh, Orbicella fabulata. And uh, they were taken at exactly the same location, except one was in 30 feet of water and the other was 100 feet immediately below it on the wall at 130 feet. And you see the, the round, robust structure that's required in that shallow water as you descend and the energy is no longer an issue from the surge and the storms but the light becomes the the limiting factor that species starts to spread out increasing its surface area so it just kind of shows you an application of how these neighborhood factors uh, really work now, one of the things that grows far faster than the corals are the algae. And in fact, if there weren't lawnmowers, the algae would quickly take over the reef, as it has in many locations of the world. So we need grazers. Now, there are fish grazers, uh, parrot fishes, surgeon fishes, some species of damsels. Uh, and uh, if you're diving in the Indo-Pacific, there is a family of fishes called rabbit fishes. Uh, they, they don't occur in the Atlantic. And without the lawnmowers, uh, you end up with a reef depicted in the lower right there. Uh, and there are also important invertebrates, as we'll talk about, that, are, that do the job of lawn mowing as well. Here's the most important. As I mentioned before, the black spiny sea urchin populations were decimated in the, uh, between 1983 and 1984, which they began recovering, but they, they never got back to their full uh, pre-epidemic uh, uh, level. Uh, but they were—they seemed to be coming back. And then about a year, a year and a half ago, beginning in the Virgin Islands, uh, an outbreak was reported where they were seen to be sick, as you see depicted in the lower image there. And what uh, scientists and research managers are requesting now is that if you do see urchins in that sickly condition, that you uh, take an image, take a picture, uh, and report it to the uh, the website you see there. I, I, by the way, any websites that you see mentioned in the in the uh, PowerPoint here will be on the uh, the webinar uh, main page where you can link to them directly. As if the problem with the sea urchins wasn't bad enough, in uh, 2014 there was an outbreak of a devastating disease. Now there have been a couple dozen diseases seen in corals for. 40 plus years, but they tended to break out and then stabilize and basically not do much. But this new disease, uh, termed stony coral tissue loss, some call it skittled, 
uh, is quite different. It's extremely virulent. Once it takes hold, it tends to consume the entire colony. Uh, the first outbreak occurred off of Miami. It's thought to have uh, perhaps been uh, associated with a, a dredging project for the harbor, although that hasn't been proven. Uh, and for several years, it was considered a, quote, Florida problem uh, until I think 19, uh, 2018. Uh, it started to be spotted throughout the Caribbean. And, and all of the countries listed here in the image are now reporting uh, the stony coral tissue loss disease. If there's any good news from this, this has really inspired resource managers and gov governments to step up and begin to invest some pretty substantial funding in not only just studying the disease, but uh, treating it. And uh, so, you know, they still have not yet identified the pathogen, uh, but there's quite a bit of effort uh, uh, being uh, done throughout the entire region. Another aspect of coral reefs that, that divers really are exposed to is the fact that these are ecosystems at war gang wars, if we're using the, the neighborhood analogy. Now, you know, you don't often see open warfare in most cities, but you often see signs of it in terms of graffiti. And even the reef has, a, in a sense, its own graffiti if you look close enough. The right image, you see two different coral colonies that have grown together, and you see in between this uh, area of void that's just bare limestone rock uh, we, that I'm calling no man's land, because it literally is. These two colonies are are fighting dur during the night normally, uh, and that's the area of, of contention at this point. And that's that's an important process that's ongoing. So rather than these these pastoral, placid environments that we, we tend to think coral reefs are, they really are aggressive, uh, warlike communities fighting over the, the most important resource, which is a place to live. Here we see uh, two different species of uh, rain corals have at it. And I have a, a quick uh, time-lapse video uh, from the Australian Marine Institute of uh, some corals actually engaging in the fight. They'll start to extend their tentacles and they can actually extend part of their stomach you know, through their, uh, their body and, and sweep across and uh, uh, sting their neighbor. Eventually, one of the two will win out. But that's the process. And you virtually never see this. And of course, it doesn't happen nearly as quickly as you see in the image. But it is happening. Now, the other thing that's important, and this has implications for coral restoration, is that even species, even, even corals of the same species, when they come together, will fight if they're not the same individual. Now, let me give you another uh, analogy. If one of you donated a kidney to me, even though we're both human beings, the same species, my body would reject that kidney because it is not me. That genome from which that uh, the person that donated the kidney is not my genome, and therefore that fighting will occur unless I take powerful anti-rejection anti drugs. Well, the same thing happens. Now, the reason this is important is with this, with the trend to restore coral reefs and to transplant corals from different locations, one of the important things that the managers have to do is keep track of the genome, the genomic uh, family structure of where they're taking those corals. Because if they plant several uh, fragments near one another and they're not all from the same original donor, they'll recognize that they do not share the same genome and they'll fight rather than to merge as, as they want them to do for restoration. Also, I, I also like to mention what I call the forgotten stepchild of the reef. And these are the sponges. Sponges are largely ignored, which is unfortunate because they're, they're critical members of the community. They're amazing filters. They have these tiny little cells called collar cells and they spin that little flagellum, generating a pretty significant uh, current. In fact, I'll often take with me a uh, syringe or a squeezy bottle of uh, fluorescein, which is a benign dye. And if you 
in, eject it outside, it will take it in. And over in a few seconds here, you'll see the, the pumping action of those little collar cells pretty significant. And so the water of the reef is being continually cleansed in this way. And uh, so you can kind of look at the sponges as sort of the, the kidneys of the reef in a sense. <clears throat> Uh, those collar cells, by the way, are so active that they they have to they 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 go through them pretty quickly and they eject those little collar cells, which become themselves food for planktonic critters. If you've ever closely observed a sponge, it's it's great habitat. There are all kinds of neat little critters that live their lives, some entirely in the sponges. They're binding agents in that they help hold the reef together. The the base of the sponge is a, a good way for the the reef to be consolidated. That's an important uh, factor in resisting storm energy. Uh, and they, I don't want to get into the details, but they also uh, fix nitrogen. They, they, they take the, the atmospheric nitrogen in the water and that we breathe and they, they convert it to a form that's necessary. And, and the, it is important to have additional nutrients added because remember, most of the nutrients are, are going to be sequestered in the deep, uh, colder water. And just as a little uh, factoid, the lower right, you know, sponges don't provide a great deal of nutritional value. Uh, they're really only two critters that really munch on them extensively. And uh, you see there the uh, the hawksbill turtle and the uh, this all of the angelfishes are spongivores, as we call them. One of the reasons I try to emphasize to divers to slow down, don't try to see the entire reef on one dive, is because you're going to miss so much. And here's an example of some really interesting relationships. Uh, green finger sponges are, are quite common on the reef. And if you look close in the tiny little holes, the osteal holes, they house sometimes these tiny little anemone-like critters called zoanthids, golden zoanthids. And they're living symbiotically in that the, uh, the Zoanthid is getting access to a lot more water because it's being pulled in through the collar cells of the of the sponge, and in turn they're providing a little bit of protection from uh, critters trying to eat the sponge. So you know, slow down and you know, smell the roses. Now, like all good things, there are good, there's there's also some bad sometimes associated, and it brings up an a point uh, an important point that's often overlooked. And that is sponges don't have zokes. They don't have, they don't need to be exposed to sunlight. Uh, and they also have the capability of dissolving and etching into the limestone. Remember, sponges, sponges are the the, the second least complex uh, or are the, uh, the least complex multicellular organism. And uh, they've been around a long time creating all kinds of chemicals. Uh, by, by the way, pharmaceutical companies are often very interested in. And uh, they look kind of benign because if you look at the, the reef depicted here, this dead coral head, really, you see this encrusting sponge. This is called Kloyana. Uh, and it looks like, well, you could kind of scrape that off and you, know, you just have the, the rock. But the reality is, because they don't need light and they have this ability to erode and etch into the reef, this is what's really happening. This is a coral head that was uh, uh, actually sacrificed and, and cut. Uh, and you see how well, from the outside, you would see these little sprigs of sponge, but invading well inside, you see the uh, just how much uh, the sponges undermine the structure. And of course, over time, with that kind of loss of, of limestone, the, the colony becomes subject to damage from storm events. So what I'm getting to, the bottom line is, all coral reefs are in this battle between growth or non-growth, or what we call accretion. Accretion just means the accumulation of limestone or bioerosion. So reefs are being eroded biologically by things such as sponges and uh, even the action of parrotfish. Uh, and with increased ocean acidification, they're being dissolved chemically as well. So it's a double-edged sword. And the bottom line is the health of a reef is much like a scale. 
if the accumulation or the accretion of limestone is greater than the, the erosion, then the reef grows. If the bioerosion and the chemical erosion exceed the accretion, then the reef gradually begins to disappear. It doesn't just magically disappear as much as at some point it's undermined to the point where it's broken apart by storm events, which is what you see here in the, in the right-hand side. These are reefs that were broken up uh, in the Florida Keys, uh, uh, the lower image at least, after Hurricane Irma. And this is just a recent paper that was uh, published that uh, documenting that uh, uh, our reef track here in Florida is, in fact, uh, continuing to erode due to uh, the lack of uh, coral cover and the fact that our ocean is 26% uh, more acidic than it was at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. We've got to get the CO2 out of the atmosphere. So anyway, uh, there are other important factors or important members uh, and those are the fishes, uh, and they have a, a very significant impact on the ecology of reefs, but uh, unfortunately, we've run out of time. So I'm going to defer to uh, next month, where we will pick up the discussion and talk about coral reef fishes. I did want to conclude, however, with uh, some action, something we can do to kind of turn this around. And it's it's not rocket science. These are simple things we can do. We want to be responsible with regard to our purchases when, when we fish and even when we garden. Because our purchases could encourage practices that are, you know, not good for the reef. You know, uh, buying corals, for example, is the worst thing we can do because that gives a market for people uh, primarily in the Philippines uh, to destroy their own reefs. Uh, fishing responsibly, we need to do so, of course, for all sorts of reasons, let alone the reefs. And then lastly, gardeners, remember gardening sometimes involves nutrients and putting nutrients in ecosystems that are designed for low nutrient conditions is, is the best way to kill them. So we need to be responsible uh, in that regard. And it, it's interesting, you know, in that many of you, I'm sure, are, are based in the, in the middle of the country. Uh, and you live in the Mississippi River uh, watershed, uh, only about half of the fertilizer put on most plants stays in, becomes part of the plant. But, uh, it, the rest of it gets into the, uh, the groundwater, into the river, into the Gulf of Mexico, and through what we refer to as the Florida loop current, it comes around and becomes part of the Gulf Stream, bathing our reefs. In the, so, you know, in other words, we're all, it's all connected. We need to be mindful in terms of what we do. Another very important tool uh, in the marine conservation quiver is uh, the uh, need to establish marine protected areas. And what I mean by that, these are no take zones. There is nothing allowed to be taken. There is no fishing allowed. There is nothing. And scientists believe that we, we should, we need to set aside about a third of the ocean in that category. And in fact, there is a campaign called 30 by 30, by 30 uh, where the initiative is to set aside 30% of the world ocean in a no-take status by 2030, because that's what that conservation scientists and managers believe we need to do to start to get the ocean back into a healthy state. Obviously support uh, dive operators that are environmentally responsible and, and the good folks at uh, Dive Ventures uh, go to great lengths to select operators that are doing the right thing, as they say. Uh, another thing you can do is uh, to reduce your uh, carbon footprint is to take into account uh, one of the reasons we are putting carbon into the atmosphere, and that's uh, air transport. About 8% of, of the greenhouse gases are put into the atmosphere through uh, air, uh, air transport. And there's a way to kind of deal with that through what are known as carbon offsets. Uh, there's an organization called the Ocean Foundation. And uh, if you log on to that site, you can go to their carbon calculator. And I did that recently. I'm going to be traveling to the Philippines later this year. And I plugged in a, a, a round trip of about 18,000 miles. Uh, it calculated that uh, I would probably be putting about 200 pounds of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere over the course of that trip. And then importantly, what's linked to that are programs that 
will pull back or, or sequester that, that CO2 using what's known as blue carbon. These are ecosystems such as uh, uh, mangrove forests, seagrass beds, and wetlands, which are able to capture and store much, much more carbon in their uh, anaerobic uh, sediments than, than uh, terrestrial forests. And uh, bottom line, uh, for a contribution of less than $20, I could pull back that uh, carbon and it linked directly to a seagrass restoration project in Puerto Rico uh, where that could be done. So it's something to take a look at. I'm not purchasing uh, corals and shells as I talked about before. Uh, if you want some guidance on seafood guidelines, the uh, Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch Program uh, produces regional guides on what seafood to uh, select and avoid. Uh, and hopefully, you know, take this information and, and don't just be informed, be an advocate, you know, tell this story, certainly tell this story to your diving friends or anyone who cares about the ocean, but, but make sure people understand that without the ocean, we're dead. We, the earth cannot survive without the ocean. So it's in everybody's best interest to have a healthy ocean. And then lastly, of course, as I've been preaching here, do what you can to get some of the CO2 out of the atmosphere. Uh, here's a blatant uh, uh, promotional advance, uh, advancement. I, I recently published a book that uh, Dive Ventures uh, by now should have in stock. So check with your local uh, location. And uh, Beneath the Blue Planet uh, talks about several things. As you see here, we, there's a section on how the ocean operates, basic oceanography. Uh, a very extensive discussion on coral reefs, which goes to in far more detail than I did here. Uh, a section on sharks because they're so important and interesting to us as divers. And then lastly, a practical section on doing the right thing, how to be responsible. If you're really interested and you want to spend about three or more hours on coral reefs, uh, I developed a uh, online course called uh, Cities Under the Sea. And uh, this is a 17 lesson, uh, very extensive, uh, comprehensive program, but still geared for people who are non-specialists. And the best news, boys and girls, is it's free. Simply log on to the website that will uh, be on the uh, resource page and you'll uh, be able to enroll. So lastly, let's talk about uh, a little bit of travel. And what I've selected this month is a very popular destination Cozumel. Uh, you see the trips that Dive Ventures has planned this year down there. Cozumel, which is actually derived from a, uh, a Mayan Yucatec word uh, meaning swallow, uh, is a very interesting place uh, for reasons as I'll explain here. It's been a popular dive destination uh, for as long as dive travel has been around. I know even back when I began diving in the late 1960s, there were intrepid folks who went to Cozumel, which soon became a major, major dive tourism destination. A little bit of history. It's always interesting to know a little bit about where you're going. Uh, the island was a very important uh, uh, commercial and ceremonial center for the Mayan uh, back in the early part of the, the first millennium. And uh, it was uh, thought to be the residence of Ixel, which was their uh, god of fertility. And, and much like Muslims have to... Uh, go on the Hajj, the Mayans, Mayan women had to go on an, a, a journey to Cozumel uh, to pray at one of the still existing uh, temples uh, during their lifetime. Now, not much happened. Uh, well, no, things cooked along very much. Uh, and uh, it was not, quote, discovered. And I, I hate to use that term. In other words, the the Spanish did not arrive there until 1518, uh, uh, and not much happened at all until the next year. Hernan Cortez, who was the, uh, as they say, the conqueror of Mexico, uh, really used the site as a staging center for that, that purpose, and uh, much to the demise of the Mayans. Uh, uh, geophysically, uh, Cozumel is quite uh, unique and interesting. Uh, like much of this region, uh, it's comprised of limestone, rock that was underwater and over time accumulated just, you know, uh, thousands of, of feet of uh, limestone deposits from 
corals, coral related animals, uh, plankton, etc. And uh, it's interesting that the, the, the <laughs> what kind of created the island itself is uh, a remnant of what we sometimes call the worst day on earth, and that is the uh, the Chicxulub crater impact, which uh, 65 million years ago. Uh, a crater the size of Manhattan crashed into uh, the Earth at about 40,000 miles per hour, uh, creating the latest mass extinction, including those of the, the dinosaurs. Uh, it did a couple of things locally. Uh, it cracked the uh, the seafloor, which eventually would uh, would be above uh, the ocean level. And uh, it created the, what they call the, the karst geology, the, the cracking and the crevices that are, are so indicative of the, the cenotes, the, uh, the freshwater springs, et cetera. It also pushed up part of the seabed in that fracturing, uh, which would eventually become the island of Cozumel. So you're, you're, you'll be diving near a artifact of the, the largest crater impact ever to hit Earth. Biologically, it's interesting. Uh, each year, there is a report card uh, uh, released for the what's called the Mesoamerican Reef. This is the reef that extends from uh, northern Yucatan uh, down through Honduras and uh, is the second largest barrier reef in the world. And the report card, as you see in the little uh, colors uh, color map there, uh, you can kind of see the reef is not doing all that well. Uh, depicted by the different colors. There's only one green area in the latest report, and it is Cozumel. So you'll actually be diving in, in the, the healthiest portion of the Mesoamerican Reef. Speaking of the diving, uh, this is literally the drift diver's paradise, and uh, you can kind of see why. Uh, the upper image is a space image of uh, the island, uh, it's about 12 miles between the mainland and Mexico and the island. And in the lower image I'm showing you there uh, is not a weather map. That's ocean circulation. And the color is speed, not temperature. Uh, so the redder it is, the faster the current moves. And what you see in that little pinch between the Yucatan Channel and uh, the Yucatan Peninsula and Cuba, much like putting your finger over a garden hose, forces that water come, coming west from the Caribbean through that small channel, creating these incredible, constant, uh, very significant currents. It's very easy diving because all you have to do is fall in the water and the boat will pick you back up. However, <laughs> you want to make sure the boat does pick you back up. And there are two things you absolutely positively need to have with you. Every individual needs to have a a surface marker buoy, an SMB or safety sausage, and a device to signal. You can kind of see in the very distant horizon, there's the boat. And you can imagine how difficult it would be to see a bobbing head versus that uh, safety sausage. And the other thing, a, uh, a signal device. All these things come with a whistle, which eh, works reasonably well if the boat's close. I would consider what I myself use are uh, the, uh, this is a dive alert, it's called. It uses the uh, uh, low pressure BC inflator hose to uh, uh, exact a, a deafening sound and boats will definitely hear that. So consider that. If you're a photographer, one of the challenges with drift diving is you can't stop because if you do, you, because the water, you're moving along with the current. But there are little devices uh, called reef hooks uh, where the, you can actually carefully and selectively put the hook in a, a dead rock area uh, and hold yourself in place long enough to take the photo. Be careful to, to stay with the group, however, if you do that. And to show you, I'm not just jiving. This was a report from just a, a few, uh, actually last week, where a, a diver was uh, reported missing. Good news, they did find him. Uh, I think he was found by jet skiers, but he was floating along on his way to uh, uh, to the Gulf of Mexico uh, because the boat did not wasn't able to find him, and I suspect he did not have an SMB. Uh, the park has of uh, the the island recognized its importance as a dive destination long ago, and in fact, in 1996, established the the Cozumel. Uh, 
uh, uh, Coral Reef Park, and you kind of see some of the, uh, not even all, but a representative sample of all the dive sites. With the ad, with the the uh, occurrence of the the stony coral tissue loss disease, uh, something you'll encounter down there now is uh, you, you see the marine park boundaries depicted, and it, within the area that you see highlighted, there are fourteen critically important sites that they rotate, and by that I mean sometimes the sites will be uh, closed, sometimes open. So you may be going down there and. If you've been there multiple times, you may not be able to go back to a site you did before, but go to a site that you've been the last time. And it's just part of the management process. Lastly, I just wanted to mention that Cozumel is very forward thinking in the way that they're managing the resource. Uh, all destinations, all travel destinations that I know of have some kind of marketing mechanism. Usually it's a travel marketing organization, uh, destination marketing. And their job is, is simply to put heads in beds, to bring more people to this destination. Well, as you've, we've all experienced more and more, there is a point where there are too many people at a destination. And we, we get this phenomenon we call over-tourism. And some very, very forward-thinking destinations, Barcelona, by the way, started at first, I believe, have taken a different tack. And they've created, completely separate from their marketing, a destination management organization. And these are, this is an entity that's looking out for the health of the destination, not a particular hotel or particular resort, or particular operator, but the health of the destination, which means keeping a, a tab on just how much the destination is being, frankly, abused or not abused by tourism. And I really, you know, take my hat off to Cozumel for doing that. And if you really, really want to know something about Cozumel, this is a, a book I found that's uh, available from Amazon that delves into everything I think you'd ever want to know. And it's, and it, it's a great way to kind of prepare for uh, a trip to a destination like that. With that said, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Uh, by the way, this is this was the first uh, webinar. And uh, if you have suggestions on... Uh, ways that could be improved or things you'd like to see added to it, please, by all means, my email address is here. Uh, our next one will be February 22nd. Thanks for having us.